now we're getting into the amplification and we're starting to see it in the southern hemispheres they're exiting out of their winter we're going to be getting water equivalents of one inch or one foot of snow for each inch and when we get these six eight twelve twenty four inch rainstorms can you imagine 24 feet of snow in a single storm at that point two floor buildings are, are buried there's no way out of it and you know you look at glimpses of history like has this occurred in the past yes or no look at this curved mosaic floor stayed together after all the earthquakes in italy just bended and buckled and just and it's, it's definitely a remnant a reminder that we've gone through this many a time in the last 2000 years about every 400 I'm five of these cycles And welcome back for the second half of Mini Ice Age Conversations right here, bright on TV Uncensored every other Friday, 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern. Before the break, we were talking about references of ancient prophecy connected into modern planetary geometry, currently where we sit in the heavens in our solar system right this day, and how governments are responding to that and how they're going to try to excuse away all of the extremes that are actually caused by a second magnetic field forming in the outer solar system. It's already started. That's the thing. Now, up to just a week and a half ago, it was not in play. It is fully in play now. It's going to amplify every single day until we get to the apex October 24th, 2024. Now, you have seen an enormous amount of extremes. I'm going to run through a few more because, it's, you know, I kind of ran out. There are just so many. Now, if you were watching before the break, you have to realize every single story I'm going through has occurred in the last seven to nine days. This is not a whole year of the biggest rain stories and floods that you've ever seen. This is since the beginning of September only. I'll even stretch it out. Two weeks. Two weeks. And this is the amount of flood. Like you might see before, back in like 2015, you would have never, ever seen a year's worth of rain story. Never saw it, never heard of it. I knew it would be coming. There were months of rain, yes. But like, you know, the slides in Greece, three years of, of rain in two days. Now we're starting to see it like it's the normal now, year's worth of something in a day or two. This is going to disrupt a lot of infrastructure. So as you start to hear more about the breakdown of supply chains, understand that there's an that's an excuse behind why it's breaking down. They might say it's geopolitics. You could talk about the Panama Canal right now. They say, oh, there's not enough fresh water in there for the lakes to raise and then refill the locks and get the ships to go. So for the next 10 months, there is going to be shipping reductions or non-shipping going through the Panama Canal, that is going to be reduced to 38 ships a day. Now you talk about a bottleneck in the supply chain. And the ships have to be unloaded to only carry 40%, 4-0 of their allotted cargo weight because of the draft. They have to raise that draft because there's not enough water. So the ships are going to be sailing around that do the Panama Canal, minus 60% of their cargo, and they're only going to let 38 ships per day through the canal system. Before that was hundreds loaded at 100 percent. So you're going to see extremes in bottlenecks and shipping right now. It's already begun. The Panamanian government put that announcement out. Uh, I think it was like Thursday of last week. You have to check on the updates on that. But the canal system, as you know, right now is effectively not 100 percent closed, but very close to it. And if the water levels drop three more feet, it will be 100% closed. They will not even, smaller ships, I may be like 5,000 tons maybe, might get through there, 1,000 tons, something. But some of these supermax carriers, nah, not a chance. Marjorie has taught millions of people how to grow an abundance of food in a grid down situation, even if you have no experience, are older or out of shape. I've spent decades finding the fastest, easiest, and funnest ways for the average person to be able to grow a lot of food. I've created a step-by-step -step process that's so simple that even kids to elders have been using it in order to grow a lot of their own food. And you can too, even if you have no experience, you're older, or you're out of shape. 
Marjorie's free webinar provides you with the tools and knowledge that you need to thrive during these difficult times. You'll learn Marjorie's three-part system for quickly producing vegetables, eggs, meat, and much more. Go to homegrown2030.com. That's homegrown2030.com or click on that link in the description box below. And now on with the video. So anyway, let's go. The reason I'm telling you this is I want to come down toward, you know, Central America, down into South America. So Dominican Republic, obviously the Caribbean area. Take a look at the floods coming through the streets here. And then if we go down to Brazil, again, we see the same profile that we saw in Greece and China. Water's up to the roofs in the homes. We saw this in Japan too, you know, in uh, August. So there's a repeating pattern of extreme amounts of rain that our modern infrastructure cannot cope with. It's so far you know, above the normal that now it's really starting to be very uh, discernible. Now I wanted to show you a couple of videos here. This one comes from India. Both these are from India, but this is how much rain is coming down out of the streams in India. Now there were buildings completely surrounding this. They've been washed away. As you can see, there's no way to get there now. So whoever's in, if I was in that building, I would be terrified right now thinking that the rest of the structures might go downstream with it. And then if you're just in a regular neighborhood, this is about how much is coming down. But remember, we're talking about the Himalayan mountains here. Uh, Himachal Pradesh, Altruna Pradesh. Uh, Shimla was one of the areas and you start to see, you know, a fair few uh, just farm animals and different kind of livestock and whatever washed down. The amount of infrastructure broken and landslides and calamities and collapses in India is at the all time record high this year. They're so stretched on the emergency services that they can't even get to towns. Oh, we'll get to you after the 10th town that needs help that just got cut off because all the bridges were wiped away. Like it's literally taken India back 100 years into, well, we're going to have to go on the old salt route. And we're going to have to wait to the dry season and just hunker down until it's over. And that's the way they're thinking right now. In the modern era, like almost all bridges are wiped across the uh, Himalayan region right now. It's just been such devastating floods. Stem to stern, north, south, east, west, even in, uh, where was that at? Kashmir. You know, that, that's a little bit once you come out, once you get out of Leh and Ladakh up that higher altitude. Uh, just massive floods there too. Lake Silver saying no, bridges, nothing, farmlands underground, underwater, excuse me. And uh, yeah, everywhere you can possibly see. And then Pakistan and Afghanistan and, and Iran, just, I mean, floods they haven't seen in thousands of years, kind of just filling up that entire region which, by the way, was the Indus Valley and the cradle of civilization when it used to be forested. So it seems like that water pattern is returning again there. So here's one that I just pulled just minutes before we got on the show, too. It came off flood list. This is in Pennsylvania. Now, for those in the States, you know, Pennsylvania, you wouldn't expect this to be in American streets like this. Although we've seen it in a few places in Virginia and, and, and West Virginia, but that's real mountainous. Well, Pennsylvania is too, but you know you don't get those severe like boom, right down ravine valleys that fill up. Like West Virginia had a few biggies, and then of course we saw the rare hurricane that went up through California. That passed, and then like a week later, you had all this another huge like extra tropical low. It wasn't actually a hurricane, and then it socked in, and we saw all the stories about uh, Burning Man, get Freezing Man, Mud Man, whatever you want to call it. These are so rare, these storms are out of place, especially with California gets smashed by the hurricane, way out in the desert, Palm Springs area, you saw the flood videos there too. But then not even in the same set of storms, another front came through and then flooded out the Burning Man area. So, I mean, are you telling me really with straight face that all these things are occurring at the same time? And for those of you that really understand mud floods and global liquefaction and Tartaria and buried buildings and knocking in a door on the second floor because it was totally buried on the first floor. Here you go. This comes out of uh, San Bernardino County. And this is what a mud flood looks like. And you know, the consistency of almost concrete like this, this is coming down through an established stream bed. But if this were to emanate from the earth in the middle of a city, you would have buildings buried 10 feet deep and you would also knock in a second floor door and you would just come in right on the top of it and here comes the the water after that 
There's a lot of repeating patterns here. And when we start to look at the reasons for past civilizations succumbing, after they reached the apex of their science and technology, agricultural production that allowed the extra food to then have those extra spare moments than just trying to keep your body alive. They come and they go on regular cycles. And these last two, the 1300s and the 1600s, there was a lot of mud in the early 1800s to 1815 as well. A lot of mud covered areas. Like after the New Madrid fault, they had so much sand and water come out from under the earth that it added 15 feet in some areas. And they just had undulating mountains of sand all over the farm fields from the Mississippi River, about 100 miles going west. It took them the better part of 70 years to clean that up and turn it back into farm fields again. And that's when we were getting more mechanized. Think of steam shovels, think of that kind of era. It took them that long. And that's a modern, well-documented events that have occurred. So if we're going hit, to get hit by this again, Libya is a perfect example of how a society can get ripped apart. I feel so bad for these people. Really, blessings and uh, wish you the best over there. The amount of water that came down in this flood as well. First, it was the Medicaid that, that dropped so much rain and then the two dams in a row broke and they overtopped. Apparently, the wall of water was some 30 to 40 feet in that area that you see damaged there. And in other areas that were quote unquote slightly damaged, it was anywhere from uh, say 10 to 20 feet in height of just roaring gravel and rock just as, as a polishing mud flood ripping apart everything that it, in its path. You know, this is just the beginning of what we're gonna see here with this magnetic field. Like some of these images, you know, I just looked at them and said, what in the heck is that? So I do want to bring you back to this prior image here. If you go down on the right side, you start to see that what looks like a little cave indentation in there. I'm wondering if we're starting to see some of the same things of more of a previous civilization that's been wiped clean that now we're starting to see it. Because if you look across a lot of these pictures down at the riverbed, you're going to see that uh, there's there's holes poking through and it definitely looks like uh, a foundation of sorts, not of the same construction materials we're using now. It looks very different in the construction. So I think that this flood wiped away what the layers were built on top and we're starting to see what was underneath, you know, three to four societies ago, three to four cycles ago. This is devastating. I can't even imagine being in this. And the problem was it hit in the middle of the night. You know, there are some images coming out now of people up on some of these floors that didn't get washed away videoing this. And, uh, you know, th this is scoured completely clean. Like, how do you rebuild from this? A quarter of the city perished. 25% of everything is gone in this city. And can you imagine the infrastructure that's not there anymore, or functional to even have that city to take away its waste and refuse? And that's how people get sick and get waterborne illnesses. So you know, just a side note, you know, if we come into some of these events, one of the main things you're going to need to think about is water purification and then removal of waste and safe disposal and storage of waste. You get sick with Jardia or some kind of stomach illness and you, you, you don't have any help, you are going to die. There's no, no question about it. You know how many people in, in the past have died of cholera? Simple waterborne things that we could treat right now with like two pills. If you don't have your meds set to, I highly encourage you go to some of these sites. Mike uh, suggests a couple of them where you can get a full array, a full bevy of different type of antibiotics, especially you want to focus on the waterborne uh, pathogen set if you can, because this is going to be a main concern. How long do you think it would be before they could get fresh water here, potable water? Where do you think people could go to the bathroom without making others sick? I mean, it's going to take them decades, plural, to clean up from this. I would imagine we're going to see a population migration out of here. This is going to become 90% less populated because nobody can really live here any longer. And this just reflects on stories of the past. You know, during the Maunder Minimum, I'm going to take you back to, say, 1640. Like 1640, the Maunder Minimum starts. The Thames has the ice fairs. You know, it gets really, really cold to the point that there's early blizzards. They can't grow crops correctly. Now, they used to have settlements in Norway and Sweden, 
but the sea ice came in so heavy that they could never resupply by sea. Now, normally before that, you know, uh, grand solar minimum period, they were able to resupply by sea pretty easily because, you know, seawater stays relatively warmer compared to the, the huge changes in air temperatures around it. But the sea ice would block it every year and there was no way to resupply. So, at, let's say 1710, when people returned back, when the sea ice flows stopped blocking the ports and they could get in there every year again, they found the same thing. 90% of the population had left or perished. They came back to 90% depleted cities. And you got to think about that. That was in the 16, 16 to 1700s when there was barely a population on the planet compared to now. Maximum, maximum 700 million people. And you come back to a place where there's, you know, if there was 100 people, there'd be 10 left. Like this is the kind of rebuild that occurred after this in the early 1700s. Like our history is murky and a lot of it disappeared and there's a lot of it you shouldn't, they are not privy to see. Like these changes are vast and all encompassing on societies. We're here again. Now you can look at it in one way. You can be all afraid and please don't do that. This is a, a huge opportunity in so many ways to break free from these systems that have taken us down because this one seems to be a little different uh, the vibrational frequency of our sun's changing upward in the whole yuga cycle as we come around again. So things are going to definitely be very different as we exit out of this cycle. The old things holding us down are just not going to be as like heavy and grabbable for a better term. They're just not going to have the grabability that they did before in the 1400s, 1300s. We're coming out of the cycle. Excuse me, I ran on a tangent sometime. Before and after pictures here. I mean, you got to realize how deep is that channel anyway? That channel got to be 20 feet deep right at the bridge there. And then look how far over and how girthy that river became breaking over the banks. I mean, biblical is the only way to describe that type of flood. And then if we come over to uh, what's it, Austria and Germany and Switzerland, look at the look at the right picture. That looks exactly like India in the in the mountains. And here in Tennessee, in East Tennessee, we had six and a half inches of rain in three hours. It was actually 6.3. Most rain record broken since 1888 in the little tiny town I live in. It didn't get to that, but it got close in some of the higher elevation points. And the Cherokee National Forest and the Smoky Mountains became just like that. So we're starting to see a repeating pattern. If you're in the mountains, you're going to have to really have an exit plan. Because this seems to be the new norm of how much water's being captured in these valleys. And then the hailstones. Biblically, you know, they're talking about bowling ball size, but accompanying these giant storms and systems of rain, this is the size of hail that's beginning to come down. You're going to see it everywhere. It's all, it's, it's just, there's nowhere to run from this. And uh, just before the show, we were chatting for a second here. One meter of snow for those of you in the United States, that's three feet approximately in eight hours in Mendoza, Argentina, just September 11th. Now we start to look at we're coming into winter in the northern hemisphere. One inch of precipitable water turns into one foot of snow. So if this was in the middle of summer, that would have rained three inches in eight hours. Not, not so crazy. I mean, yeah, it would cause flooding, but it wouldn't be like some of those previous pictures we've seen. But what happens when you get a foot of rain in a day that's 12 feet of snow. Now we're getting into the amplification and we're starting to see it in the southern hemispheres. They're exiting out of their winter. We're going to be getting water equivalents of one inch or one foot of snow for each inch. And when we get these six, eight, 12, 24 inch rainstorms, can you imagine 24 feet of snow in a single storm? At that point, two floor buildings are, are buried. There's no way out of it. And, you know, you look at glimpses of history, like, has this occurred in the past? Yes or no? Look at this curved mosaic floor. Stayed together after all the earthquakes in Italy, just bended and buckled. And just and it's, it's definitely a remnant, a reminder that we've gone through this many a time in the last 2,000 years. About every 400, I'm five of these cycles. And again, ancient history here. A lot of people, the Hende Cross, there's really been a lot of conjecture. And I was talking with one of the researchers here who's like, one of the team leads on this and he's talking to me he's like can you explain these four stars and i'm like 
he's like this angry son. We don't know why the full, what's the stars with the angry son? And I was like, well, I can kind of give you a little explanation on that. Here you go, the four gas giants are those, that square that they're referencing in the cross. It's all related, whether you're at the tree of life or whether you're at these more ancient, the Hyundai cross, they all have the same thing exactly in common. This is a sign in the heavens. This is the sign in the sky. It's not a comment. This is the sign everybody's looking for. We're here again. You can, I, like, I'm super rejoiceful and so thankful that we're here right now because, you know, the things we're going to be able to do with our minds and bodies and our spirits during this change in time, oh, people for thousands of years would just, oh, they would give anything to be born and alive at this time right now. Knowing this knowledge, not going in it from fear, but going in it through opportunity and change and oh, uplifting, like the breathing again of life itself. And a little bit different look at the same tree of life again, in case you missed the first hour or the first part of the hour. When I reference those together, again, you start to see, you know, the four gas giants lining up and the sun and the earth and the, in these uh, different the da'ath would be us at the uh, the hidden knowledge being broken open. You notice how it is being broken open right now. There's a lot of hidden knowledge coming out everywhere. This is it. I hope you share with your friends and family and try to get this conversation started because, you know, these changes are so big and so vast, they can't hide them anymore. And they're, it's just almost comical when they try to, we, we need to block the sun out now. Now I had to get this one off archive because they already memory hold this one. And that wasn't too long ago. That was June of 2023. They're already talking about blocking the sun, but they already memory hold this one. So you couldn't find it. And then here's Politico. Uh, White House cautiously opened the door to study blocking sun's rays to slow global warming. Okay, that's a great excuse and like narrative feed for all these changes. They will never admit it's a second magnetic field in the solar system. So you're going to hear more of this garbage, more ridiculousness. of the. It's going to continue up and up with the just ridiculous response to something that can't be controlled as a natural cycle. So they're probably in their leather sofas in their castles laughing their, their butts off going, oh, I can't believe they would believe we're going to block the sun. We need another excuse. Let's drill to the core of the planet and fill it with water. You know, something just ultra ridiculous. You live here. Third planet from the yellow thing. We reference this. Why, were, why did all the cultures were so heavy into worshiping the sun and keeping an eye on the sun? Because they knew when the magnetic field changed, something big happened on the planet. Uh, and this is the astronomical compendium from 1550. Now, ah, my 1550 time frame didn't ever know this delicate of instrumentation was around. I thought it was clunky wooden wheels on wagons with oxen. Wait a second, where'd this come from? Let's zoom in on it. I wanted to zoom in. I know you did. I know you wanted me to zoom on that. So here we go. But this kind of delicate understanding of cycles of the heavens in 1550 means that mm, there's a missing piece of history that only a very certain part of our civilization is privy to. The rest of it's hidden for all of us out here. This, stuff, this has been around for thousands of years, this information. Good hunting on the comment. I'll see you next week. Bye for now.